Amy, welcome to the stage today. We're so happy to have you. Um, is there anything else you'd like our audience members to know about you before we dive into questions? Um, no, I think we'll probably get to it all during the questions. All right, sounds good. Now, just a quick reminder to everybody uh, watching us at uh, at home or on the live stream, hi. If y'all have questions today, please, please feel free to submit those, send them in in the chat. Um, we would love to uh, answer any questions you might send us. All right, so Amy, let's dive in here. Now, your journey started studying hotel and restaurant administration, um, and you have uh, kind of come around full circle to become a software development engineer at Expedia. What was your thought process during those career transitions and how did you navigate such kind of really diverse fields? Yeah. Um, well, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. And uh, first, I just kind of want to tell you what my journey is so that you can see um, that it wasn't one huge jump, but a series of uh, smaller ones, right? So it, it's, it's a little bit easier to digest when you um, take it in small pieces instead of like hospitality to um, software engineer, right? So um, as Meg said, I majored in hotel restaurant administration. And uh, then I was working as a concession manager for um, Seahawks Stadium, uh, White River Amphitheater, and then the University of Washington. And after a few years at uh, the University of Washington, I was ready to get married and start a family. And the hospitality industry was, in my opinion, not conducive to that lifestyle. Um, I worked a lot of nights and weekends, and uh, I, I just needed something else. Uh, so a friend that I had worked with at the stadium um, posted on Facebook that there was an opening for um, an administrative assistant at Expedia. And most people would think of that as a huge step backwards because I had been managing thousands of people on an event day um, nonprofit groups, employees, um, working for manager and being a manager. And so um, I asked her how much the position paid and the role paid the same that I was getting paid as a manager to be an hourly, an hourly um, individual contributor. And so I decided why not, right? Why not try for it and, and see if I can get it and, um, I actually did not get the job <laughs> when I first interviewed. And uh, then the person who got the job was um, falling asleep on the job and they let her go. And my friend said, look, you've got to interview, you know, see my friend. And um, so I interviewed again this time with our chief information officer. And he said, um, you know, I hope someday someone else gives my, he said, I have two daughters and I hope someone else gives uh, them a chance someday. And so I'm going to give you a chance. And Let's let's try it out, right? Um, so that got me in the door at Expedia, and uh, from there, I uh, I worked at, in as an admin in my admin role. I worked directly with the procurement team. Um, so when they had an opening on their team, the uh, the manager came to me and said <clears throat> she had an opening and she wanted me to apply for it. So I did, and um, I asked her actually a bit about it about the role and what you know it entailed. I decided that uh, I had worked with purchasing in my role at um, the stadium. And uh, so it seemed like a good fit. Uh, so from there, um, I actually moved into leadership. And <clears throat> in that team, I worked closely with the financial systems platform team here at Expedia um, because they managed the team that, um, uh, that ran the, they were the team that ran, managed the tool that I used to create purchase orders, right? Um, so I worked with them very closely. I was a subject matter expert um, for the procurement team with their tool. And um, I, I noticed one day that they had an entry level system administrator opening. Um, so I talked to one of the current system administrators, asked her about what the role was. And, um, and I had worked with the hiring manager there as well. Um, uh, through my role in procurement. And thankfully he took a chance on me and he gave me, um, he gave me the job as the entry-level sysadmin. So that was how I like moved into the IT world. Um, and oh man, that was, <laughs> that was a huge jump, uh, for me because even though I was using the tool, I still, I had to learn SQL. I had to learn other languages. Um, so thankfully they hired me and I, I made that jump. Um, 
But again, in that transition, before I took the role, I spoke to somebody who was already in the role to find out more about it and would it fit um, with what I what I thought I could achieve. <clears throat> During my time as a sysadmin, then I um, worked with the test teams and they had an opening for a test automation engineer. And in that role, uh, I needed to learn VB script, um, which I used a tiny bit um, with dealing with macros in Excel. Um, and I, I talked with the hiring manager for that role and just told her, you know, I was up front with her and said, look, I only know this, this, this much. And she said, that's okay. Um, uh, your, she, because I had worked with her, she said, your attitude and aptitude for learning um, means that I know that you will succeed very quickly in the role. So she um, also took a chance on me. And um, eventually that role uh, changed into a software engineer role because at large corporations, things are always changing. Um, and uh, I still work for the financial systems platform team. Um, and uh, it's been actually really great. And I've learned so much. And I've just learned things along the way because um, every person and every team that I worked with, I, um, I, I've just looked at the, at the role first to see if it was something that I thought I could do. Um, and in every role that I went into, it wasn't something completely 100% new. It was, um, you know, is there something of this role that I could take into the next role um, that, so that the days when I was having a bad day, I could fall back to the stuff that I knew. And then there was days when I had new learning. So, um, so there was always that kind of a, a piece. So there was always something a little bit different. Um, navigating the big jumps, especially from uh, procurement to sysadmin and from sysadmin to test automation engineer was not easy, um, but I had someone who championed me and was ready to answer questions whenever I got stuck. Um, the other thing is setting boundaries um, and expectations. For example, when I moved into the procurement space, I had unknowingly made some mistakes um, that affected a member of another team. She got frustrated and sent this email blast that was just, you know, not pleasant. <laughs> and So helpful those are, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And so I just reached out to her individually. Instead of getting like super angry and defending myself back to this blast, I just... I just met with her and said, look, I'm new. I didn't realize that I was making this mistake. I'm very sorry. I'll correct it. And in the future, if I make a mistake that affects you, just let me know right away and I will uh, make sure that I don't do that anymore. And if I do it, then feel free to go and blast. And, you know, and and by setting that boundary and that expectation for her, um, it, it really fixed everything. I mean, she she took it, she accepted it, and she we've had a great relationship ever since. So um, just making sure that people I, were aware, right? Yeah, I applaud you for having the wherewithal to do that because that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you know, like, it was a mistake. I didn't do this on purpose. Like, it can be really hard to kind of confront that energy. But yeah. Good for you. Like, that's not an easy thing to do. So congratulations. Like, that's very impressive. Thanks. You're welcome. Um, yeah, so I think pretty much just just making sure that um, before I I took a role, I I found out a little bit more about it, um, and then had someone there who um, I could go to, you know, on those days that I was just, um, you know, not needing help, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's always there's always going to be those days where stuff's a little bit harder or you're just kind of looking at this like why did I think this was a good idea why like the motivation might be gone focus might not be there I think we've all had those days so yeah invaluable yeah. to have somebody else in your car corner who knows where you're trying to get and is like no, no 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 you're just at the hard part you're on the hump just keep on exactly. moving exactly exactly yeah. yeah I love that okay so I think your your experience in the in the hospitality industry I think is very familiar to a lot of us there's many of us who spent time in those trenches yeah. Um, is there any skill or lesson that you picked up from the from your time in hospitality that you use regularly? Yeah, so um, for uh, when I had just started working as a concession manager at the stadium, um, we had a particularly busy event, and I was only managing three concession stands at the time, which um, 
doesn't seem a lot to me now, but at the time it, it seemed like a lot, right? And midway through the night, um, our biggest concession stand was hit really hard. Um, and I felt really bad for the workers that were getting slammed. So I jumped in and started helping them thinking, you know, they can see that I'm just as hardworking as them, even though I'm a manager and I want to, you know, show them that I'm on their team and I'm on their side. And uh, my manager found me working in the kitchen <clears throat> and he pulled me out <laughs> and he explained to me that if I got mired in the details of that uh, one location, then I didn't have, um, I didn't have any idea what was going on in the other locations, right? They could have been on fire and I would have had no clue. Um, and as a manager, I needed to know what was going on in those locations. And so um, what I should have done was go and find other resources, maybe from a slower location and move them into that busy location. And um, that lesson has stuck with me with every job, um, whether it's a manager or an individual contributor. You know, if I get so stuck on one thing, how do I know what's happening with the other things I'm supposed to be working on? How um, I'm, I'm, if I'm too like too narrow-minded about what I'm working on, then I'm, I, I don't know if you've ever heard the thing, um, seeing the forest for the trees. So I'm just looking at a tree, right? Instead of the whole forest. And I need to be making sure that I'm looking at everything. So I think that is the thing that's really um, stuck with me the most is just, like step back. Doesn't matter if you're in hospitality or if you're um, in, in as a system in, or you know a system administrator or an engineer, uh, whatever you're doing, just make sure you're looking at at everything and focus on um, the things that need to get done um, first, and and maybe um, finding instead of finding other resources to help those people. Now it would might be something like um, pushing a deadline back or um, finding someone else who has an answer when I'm stuck or um, seeing if there's anybody else who has extra cycles or even watching my peers and seeing if they're stuck and helping them when I have extra cycles and things like that. So I think that's definitely the, the biggest thing for me. That's a really good lesson to take from it, honestly. And so, and that's a lesson that's really hard for a lot of people to learn. Um, no matter where you're managing, it can be very difficult to pull yourself out of the minutia. So I love that advice. Um, okay, many people feel pressured to follow a linear career path. I think I'm well among the, the, a lot of us that were told like, okay, you go to school, you graduate high school, you go to college, you get your degree, then you go get a job. That's what you do. Um, what advice would you give to someone who is hesitant to explore different industries or different roles outside their current expertise? If you already feel like you're on the train, what, like, what do you, what do you say to people that are like, ah, oh, but I'm already here? Yeah. <clears throat> so I've been really blessed, um, having a lot of people in my corner. Um, my father was the second of seven children, uh, and they were all migrant workers. So they traveled from Mexico and through the U S and, one of his sisters is actually now the CFO at Idaho National Laboratories. Um, as she recently told me that our careers are lattices, not ladders. So if you chase experiences and not the next promotion, then the money will eventually find you. And I agree with her that our careers are lattices, right? The idea of the lattice is that we have flexible mobility in our careers. And every role I took was something that interested me, which meant that I got to learn something completely new. Um, I don't have statistics, um, but it seems that most jobs today are looking for a breadth of knowledge and not just subject matter experts. And so if you have a career that is more of a lattice style, you'll have a breadth of, of knowledge <laughs> and the companies that the companies are looking for. And there's more opportunities open to you, right? You can move in any direction, not just up. Up isn't the only way to get a pay raise. Um, it might be a quicker way to get a pay raise, but not necessarily a more fulfilling way. <laughs> um, so don't let that be your biggest motivation. And also earlier this year, I attended a Latinas in Tech conference in San Francisco. And during that conference, the CFO of Toast, um, her name was Elena Gomez. She said something that changed my, my entire view of my career path. Um, she said we should capitalize on our uniqueness. And it really hit me. It just really stuck. And uh, before hearing that, I was a little bit ashamed of my path, right? Like I didn't want, I, I didn't have the traditional path. And so I didn't want other people, um, other engineers to know that I didn't have this background of, of going to school and learning all these languages, coding languages and everything. And so 
Um, after that session and after hearing what she had to say, it really um, made me realize it's a way for me to stand out, right? Sharing mm -hmm. my path is a way for me to stand out and say, look, the challenges I've, look at the challenges I've faced and I've still made it this far, right? Um, yeah. So in my opinion, a, a nonlinear path gives us better stories to tell and those stories help us to be remembered and to stand out. Heck yes, are you kidding? I mean, if anybody sat through more than one chat of mine, you probably know, like I also have a nonlinear career path. I went to law school. I was sure that's what I was gonna do. Then I worked in um, purchasing for a manufacturing company. Then I worked in audiobooks. like any port in a storm, y'all. Some of us didn't graduate into a great, you know, great uh, uh, economy. So I think you're right. It is it is a superpower and it can be that uniqueness that may, that separates you, that gives you those extra experiences that no one else in the room has had because they were possibly either all on the same path or roughly adjacent to each other on their parallel paths. So I think it is really important to, to highlight that like just because you don't have what's, what the rest of the people in the room have, that's not a bad thing. That doesn't make you less than. It just makes you different, which gives you a leg up and, and you know something that the other people in the room don't have. I think that's really, really good advice. And thank you, Amy, for sharing, because I also know that feeling of like, I didn't go to college for this. Are you going to be mad at me that I'm doing this right now? Because like, yeah. Um, all right. So we talked a little bit about hospitality and how that, um, you know, how that that kind of played into uh, some of the lessons in your career. Um, do you think that your experiences in hospitality have shaped your approach to software development and leadership within the tech field today? Do you think that you have a certain like way of looking at that because of your background in hospitality? So, um, yes, Um also just part of who I am, right? So the hospitality industry is about serving other people and helping them. And even though I'm now a software developer, I'm still serving others. Um, the, what I'm building is to help other people, right? It's just not in a front facing way. I still have customers and deadlines. Um, the experiences I had in hospitality have helped me to better handle all different kinds of people. I don't have a problem speaking with upper management, with my peers, with customers, because I had to deal with so many different people, um, different types of people in the hospitality industry. Um, and oftentimes they were angry or they were happy or, you know, so not just different types and levels of people, but also people who, um, you know, were in different <laughs> levels of frustration, right? Bringing um, different energies to the yeah, table. Yeah, exactly. Right. So because I had to learn all of that, it helped me um, um, because I worked with so many different types of people in the hospitality industry, um, managers, employees, and nonprofit groups all needed something different from me. So I had to learn how to discern what they each needed and adapt quickly. Um, and now I can apply those same principles as a developer. At the core of who I am, though, I love helping other people. As I look back on each of the roles that I've um, mentioned to you, uh, every one of them was some way of serving somebody, right? Even transitioning to administrative assistant, that's a huge service role, right? It's, yeah. it's not hospitality. Um, the work that I'm doing right now is uh, I'm automating processes that are essentially busy work for other people on my team. Um, so it's helping them also. And, and that's the work that I'm most passionate about, uh, the work that's going to take away the headaches for the other people and save them time. I think that's excellent. And you're right. You know, there is you you do still have a lot of the same functions. Um, and I think God, I'm telling you, man, uh, one year in the service industry. And I, I think it should be mandatory. I really do. Because yeah. um, it teaches you all kinds of amazing skills that let's be real. They're talked about as kind of pejoratively as like soft skills. Yeah. But that's the stuff that follows you from job to job. That's the kind of thing that's like the nuts and bolts of how you get through life. So yeah, I love this experience. All right. Um. Okay. Obviously, we've talked about some of your more significant career pivots as well as some of the smaller leaps in between. Um, when it comes to the bigger pivots, how did you overcome challenges to help you find success in a completely new field? You're not just in a new role. You're in a new industry. Yeah. One of the biggest hurdles was actually my belief in myself. Um, when I became a test auto automation engineer, I only knew SQL from my role as sysadmin um, and a tiny, like I said, mentioned before, a tiny bit of VB script. Um, fortunately, the language that I needed to use for the automation engineer was VB script, but I still only knew a tiny bit of it, right? <clears throat> and as I said before, I was upfront with a hiring manager, let her know 
um, that I only knew a little bit, but she was my biggest champion and uh, she still is. Uh, she, there were so many days when I told both her and me, you know, what did I get myself into? I, I really was like, what did I sign up for? And I had, I had some serious um, doubts and, um, you know, just, just was spiraling. Right. And she always brought me back, um, and, you know, made sure that I knew that I was what the team needed and that the things that I brought to the table were, um, useful. And she's just been a mentor for me. Right. Um, there's been other people as well on the team that have taught me new things. Expedia has a lot of, um, ways to learn things also. And, um, every team that I've been on has just been super helpful. Um, everyone is, has been really willing to teach, right? I've, I have never come across anybody in my time at Expedia that has just been like, I don't know, I don't have time for you. I'm not going to show you. I'm not going to help you. Um, and so that, those are the other things, right? Is just being patient with myself having this mentor who's been wonderful and um, learning, right? Just asking for help. Um, I realized that I didn't, I didn't want to ask for help because I thought it would make me look weak. And, but I've realized now that asking for help when I need it is not weak. It just means I come to a solution quicker, <laughs> right? We're stronger yep. together and we have to find the people that lift us up and when we're down and we need to do the same for them. Yes. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm loving all of this. Um, we have probably time for like one more question. Um, all right, let's, oops, sorry, I'll medicine alarm. I forgot to turn that off. Um, okay. Let's talk about Expedia group. I want to pull back up here. Um, yeah. career pivoters, returners, you know, and people like yourself and myself who are coming with very nonlinear paths. Um, yeah. how does Expedia group help to pe help people like that to forge their own career paths at Expedia? Yeah, I love this question. I, I had to do a bit of research and remembering on this one because there's not something that that was like, oh, here's what Expedia does, right? Um, but Expedia is a really large company um, and they have so many different job opportunities. They also have something called gigs where people can apply um, and spend a small amount of time on another team so that you can learn something with the other team. Um, we have a career hub where you can find a mentor. You can access all different kinds of learning options. Um, they even have options to learn other languages on there, <laughs> which is cool, um, at least to me. Um, you can see what jobs are available on the Career Hub. Um, and you can also put information about yourself. So not just, you know, we, your, your current job stuff, but you can put um, different things that you have experience with so that when other people are looking at that or at you, um, they can see that information there. <clears throat> um, at our Seattle campus, uh, and maybe other elsewhere, I'm, I'm not totally sure, but definitely at our Seattle campus, we have a team called the host experience team. Um, they've implemented something called find my people where they set up different events for people, um, like-minded people to get together. So some different groups, for example, were Lego enthusiasts, board game enthusiasts, um, plant people, skating people, hikers, gamers, soccer, Etc. And it's a great way to meet people that are not necessarily in your same line of work or in your same career trajectory, but it gives you an immediate way to start a connection. Um, we also, yeah, yeah, it's pretty fantastic. Uh, you just yeah. have to make time for it, right? You have to make the time for it. Um, well, that goes back to what you said earlier about boundaries, you know? Exactly. Yeah. Um, we used to have a Slack channel that you could join where you would it would pair you up randomly with someone else to go have coffee for a meet and greet and just be one-on-one -on -one meet and greet to meet someone else, some other random person in the company. Oh, yeah. We use Donut for that on our Slack channels. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It's a good one. It's a good one. It's a, it sets up a, a question. It's really fun. But yeah, we oh. use the same kind of thing. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, we also have inclusion and diversity groups, which we call inclusion business groups or IBGs. Um, to help people connect with others uh, like them. Uh, we have group for women, Black people, vets, Asians, uh, LGBTQ, IA+, um, accessibility inclusion, Indigenous people, CHI, which is our Jewish 
population um, and the Latinx community. I'm the I'm currently the vice president, as you said, for the Seattle chapter of our Latinx group, which is called LEAD, which stands for Latinx at Expedia and Allies for Development. Ooh, I like that. That's a good acronym. <clears throat> Thanks. Um, we also have groups called community business groups, which focus on creating inclusive workplace cultures alongside the IBGs, like um, Expedia volunteers, which is people who are just passionate about volunteering. Um, <clears throat> Friends of Grief is another oh. one. Uh, we have a group for people who return from maternity leave. Um, we have a group for parents and caregivers. Sage, which is our sustainable and green um, Expedians, and Toastmasters. And there's just so many ways to connect, right, with the, with your fellow workers <clears throat> and all these, in my mind, at least, these people are, um, I mean, the people that you work with on your team are definitely going to be there and help you. And they're, they're great for, you know, making connections and, and possibly, you know, moving on to something else. But these other groups are ways to meet people who are not doing the same thing that you're doing. So if you are pivoting, these are the people that you would reach out to and say, hey, what is it you do? Oh my gosh, that sounds really interesting. Can you tell me more about it? And is do you have an opening? Right. So I think just having all of that available is is something that makes Expedia really great. Yes. Yes. I love hearing all about, all about this. All right. We are almost out of time, Amy, but I just want to say a huge thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's been wonderful to talk to you. I hope this wasn't nearly as scary as you were anticipating, uh, but I really hope that we'll get to do this again soon. Yeah, thank you so much, Meg. I had a great time. I really appreciate you inviting me. Good. I'm glad. Now, if you are at all curious about Expedia, y'all, we are, um, they're going to be participating in our virtual job fair tomorrow. So yours truly will be hosting. So you'll get to see at least one familiar face. Um, but the virtual job fair is going to start at noon. It's going to start at 12 p.m. Eastern. It's going to run through 6 p.m. Eastern. Um, so do go ahead, y'all join us for that. If you haven't signed up yet, um, there's links that we'll be sharing uh, as we go that y'all can can, uh, can sign up for those. So definitely check it out because there's going to be more great reps from Expedia as well as Amy. Um, so you'll get to uh, meet even more amazing people from that team. So definitely check it out. All right, Amy, that is going to bring us to the end, but thank you so, so much. It's been really, really great. And uh, yeah, excited to hang out with you some more tomorrow. Bye everyone. <laughs>